Welcome back. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate greatly your ability to work with me in that last class. Um, I realized the video wasn't the best, but I think I, I, I did the best as I could. Um, I didn't mention, but in the day class, uh, something funny happened where there was a lot of feedback. So I said, okay, let me mute their microphones, try and get rid of the feedback. And what I didn't realize was I couldn't unmute them. So the entire class, they could hear me, but I couldn't hear them. But this shows the difference between day students and night students. If one of them could have gone to the uh, podium and clicked the unmute button, it would have been fine, but no one had the guts to do it. You would have done it in one second. At least one probably would have. Uh, but I appreciate it. So that was actually kind of weird. What? <laughs> well, I think what happened was someone was afraid of messing up even worse. They just sat there and like petrified, like just waiting. And I, so I actually had to have them. They would actually type me stuff. I'll repeat it, and then it was, it was not ideal. But I thank you very much. Um, uh, the past two weeks, I, I've done a lot of traveling for my book. I did talks at like seven or eight law schools, um, probably over 500 people the past couple weeks, and uh, did media, newspaper. But it's very good to be back. Um, I don't think law professors actually tell you this much. We actually really like our jobs. We really do. And I, I bet you don't believe it. I actually missed this. I actually missed coming here at 6 o'clock at night and teaching about recording systems. I know it sounds perverse, but I do, and I do really enjoy this. So I, I appreciate you indulging me. I don't like canceling class, and I've not done it before. This was something I had to add to for the, uh, for the book release, but I do appreciate it. And I, uh, I thank you for sitting through a disembodied head, like you know, it was Apocalypse Now or something, of, uh, of me just talking for 90 minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions you have? Um, the mortgage class was actually a pretty decent one to do the remote one because a lot of you already had mortgages, and I'll probably come back to that at some point to review. But today's a pretty jam-packed day as we're reading, so I'd like to move ahead unless there are any questions. Okay. All right. So from this point forward, almost every single question I ask you or every question on the exam will involve a person selling the same piece of property twice. Okay? In one form or another. Everything I'm testing you on from this point forward will involve a person selling property to person A and then selling the same land to person B. The reason why I'm going to ask this question over and over again is because it tests whether you get reporting systems. Okay? It, it, these are not hard concepts, but the facts can get kind of tedious. So first, um, and oh god, I don't want to get in trouble. Where, where, should, where did I finish last? Does anyone even remotely remember? He's like this. Uh, okay, I'm just going to start right down here. Ross? What would be the problem if we didn't have reporting systems? Why, why are they so important? Hmm. Right. The reason why we have reporting systems is to make sure that people can confidently buy property and then they can be ensured that the property they're buying is actually owned by the seller. Okay? Josh, why do we have reporting acts? Uh, to require the property owner to lodge a list records the Good. Okay. The reason why we have these laws is to have records. So for most of uh, feudal England, you know, we always studied feudal England, there was no such thing as a recording act. There was no good way of knowing who bought what. Um, in many respects, this was a very American institution. I'm not even sure how it sprung up, but in American counties throughout the country, local courts or local town halls kept records of when one person bought land from another. And these are important because they promote certainty, they promote efficiency, they can make you feel safe that when you're buying something, you know that the person who's selling it actually owns it. So when everything goes according to plan, when everything's recorded properly and all the deeds are lined up, we don't really care for this class. We care about the cases where someone messes up. And people can mess up in a couple ways. One way they can mess up is by just forgetting to record. Um, this is innocuous. This is not really dangerous. Uh, people might not be familiar with the law. They might not know the requirements. They might just buy something if it gets recorded. The more evil way that people mess up is by intentionally screwing. They sell the same property to multiple people. Or they might sell the same interest to several people. And when someone does this, it really makes the property records confusing because it's unclear who actually owns it. And this gives rise to what we have the recording acts. 
Recording acts are meant to protect people who innocently buy property. The law doesn't want to punish someone who does their homework, buys a piece of property, has no knowledge that you know, there's been some, some shenanigans going on. The law wants to protect that person. Okay. So before we start, I want to explain one concept very clearly. We often speak of property in terms of the bundles of sticks, right? I buy from, uh, let's see, I buy a property from Nick. We only speak of, you know, my relationship to Nick. Then if Nick sells it to Capricia, we speak of both their relationship and then as between the two of us. Always think of who we're talking about. So, Nick, if I, if I sell you a piece of property, right, I sell you Blackacre, and you don't record it, you still own it? Okay. Okay. So say I sell you Blackacre and you fail to record, right? A year later, I come back and say, nah, Blackacre's mine, and I start coming your land. Could you sue me for trespass? But you're not, you're not the record owner. You never recorded. You're lazy. So why could you sue me for trespass? You're right. Well, it's still the owner. As between who? Okay. That's exactly right. If I sell to Nick and Nick doesn't record, as between the two of us, he's the owner. Why? Because we have the deed. We have something doc documenting it. That's only between the two of us. Okay. So, in the past, whenever there was something in the book that said, you know, A sells to B and B doesn't record, I always told you ignore that. Don't worry about it. The reason why I told you to ignore it is because it doesn't matter. Because as between A and B, Nick and I, the recording doesn't matter. Okay. So now, Nick, let 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 let's let's twist it a little bit. I sell Blackacre to you, right? Okay, and then I sell Blackacre against Capricia. She has no knowledge of my early transaction because you never recorded. Okay? Now Capricia sues you for trespassing. Who owns Blackacre in that case, between the two of you? Oh, but I did sell it to her. As between the two of you, forget about me, I'm out of the picture, I'm gone. As between the two of you, who has the better claim? What do you think? Okay. Let's say she records, right? You never recorded. As between the two of you, who has a better claim? She does. Let me say that again. I sell Blackacre to Nick. Nick never records. I then sell Blackacre again to Capricia. She she records. She goes to the records office and records it. Okay. They both want the same piece of property. As between the two of them, she has a better claim. We'll go through this more later, but I'm setting up the frame of every single case we're going to do today involves some jerk selling the same piece of property twice to two different people. This, this is how these questions are, are, are framed. So we often speak of not necessarily who owns it, but who has the better claim. Arguably, both Nick and Capricia own Blackacre. They both own it but in different ways. She, her claim is better than his. Okay. So let's actually, um, let's actually show you pictures. Has anyone actually done title searching in this class? I think some, some. Can you tell us a little about your experiences, please? Uh-huh. So do these big, stinky, dusty books look familiar to you? And they are, they're big and dusty? Okay, so when you were doing land uh, uh, title searches, how far back did you have to go? Which is what year? Okay. Well, actually, It's actually a disputed point. It's actually a disputed point as well. Um, but the purpose of the recording system is to keep track of who bought what and when. Okay. Anyone else want to share a story before I go ahead? Anyone else? Okay, I'll go on. 
The purpose of these laws is to track who sold what to whom. And there's two main kinds of indexes. Okay? The first kind is what's called a grantor grantee index. And I know you can't see this. This is really little. But this is grantee, and that says grantor. <laughs> okay? I'll explain it in a, in a second what that means. The second kind, which is very rare, is called a tract index. T R A C T, tract. The tract index identifies land based on lot numbers. Okay? So you can't really see, see it here, but it's actually a description of the land. In a number of states, kind of more, in the, uh, more out west, where the land is much bigger, the government divided a county into lot numbers, tract numbers, and say, OK, you know, black acres on track one, and white acres on track two, and you know, green acres on track three. They're numbers. You can find them on a map. But for most states, it's impossible to divvy up the land like that. It was just never done. And Texas is a. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for most cities, Harris County among others, you're going to have what's called a grantor grantee index. And let me explain what that means. So first, mini mini review, grantor, grantee. Anna, tell me who's the grantor, who's the grantee. I swear, I did this, I did this this morning in property with with one else, and it was like the same question. So the land is mm -hmm. Yes. And what about the grantee? <laughs> what does the grantee do? What do they, how, how do they, if the grantor gives, what does the grantee do? Yes. Okay. You're making it way too hard. Receives. Just remember that me, e, receiving. The grantor, also the seller, right? And the grantee is the buyer, right? Well, we'll do this probably at least eight other times a semester. So hopefully, eventually, we'll get it. Seller, buyer. The grantor grantee index actually consists of two books, two separate books. Okay, let me go back to these photos. This is grantee, this is grantor. The purpose of these two separate books is to keep track of who's giving and who's receiving. Every transaction is recorded in both books. So for example, if I sell Black Acre to Anna, right? Who am I? Am I the grantor or the grantee? And who are you? That's right. So, uh, so say for example, you know, I sell Black Acre. So, it, so in the book, the first book, which would be the Grantor Index, this records all the sellers. And in the Grantor column, it would say Josh, right? And the Grantee column, it would say Anna. Okay, everyone get that? That's book number one. The second book is called the Grantee Index. And here, actually I'd say it's sorted by the buyer. So the first column will be Grantee, and Anna's name would be there. And in the second column will be Grantor, and there'd be Josh. Okay. The reason why this is important is say then Anna wants to go sell Black Acre, right? And someone wants to do a title search. They'll know to look up Anna's name. But where would they look it up? In which index? Uh, John. So if Anna wants to sell the land, say Anna wants to sell the land to you, John, and you want to do a title search, 
How would you check if Anna actually owns the land? Which book would you look in? One or two? Uh, two. Why? Yes. Right. Yes. When I sell the land to Anna, she's the grantee. If John wants to buy it from her, the way that he would check is by looking in the grantee book. And she would say, okay, I go under Anna, right? And then you see that Anna got it from Josh. Then you could ascertain that at some point Anna actually got it. So you're always going to be starting with the grantee index. Why? Because you want to make sure the person who's selling it is the owner of the land, that no one's name comes before them. Because I can imagine, say, Anna sold it to John, and then she also uh, sold it to Bruce, right? If she sold it to both of you, you wouldn't know his name, and he wouldn't know your name. The only name you both would know would be Anna. And then you'd have to go check the grantee index to make sure that she has it. She's more okay? we'll, do a, we'll do a more uh, a detailed example in a minute, but does everyone get, get that much? Everyone okay with that? It's going to get a little more complicated in a second. Everyone okay? Good. So going back to this image, when I say recording, there's a, there's a, there's a number of things. And, and I, this thing's not big enough for you to see. But you have the name of the grantee. You have any of the grant for You have what's actually being reported. You can report just about anything. You can report a deed. You can report a mortgage. You can report an easement or a license. Actually, uh, you can record just about anything. It will often describe the date of the deed and maybe describe the land. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Luke, when you were doing your, your title searches, how detailed were the titles on what were that? You mean that? Yeah, going back to the 19th less, century. Less was it tougher when you went back in time to find what you wanted? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so how long would it take for you to do a, to do a search back to 1830? Yeah. Well, that's a subsurface, right? Yeah. It's like long. Okay. And we'll do a case for that later. Okay. So everyone okay with this so far? I want to do the example. It's on page 648 in your book, um, which I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Uh, and I'll, I'll make this painless. I'll call them one person at a time for each step. So, Bruce, uh, you'll be up first, okay? So, on page 648, okay, so I'm, going to, I'm not going to show the screen, so I hope everyone has a book. But this paragraph begins, it assumed that a man named Dubeck, okay? So, um, so Bruce, so you, you're wanting to buy a piece of land, right? Let's just go to a new page, so it's on that one. And you know that uh, you find a seller, and his name is Dubek. Okay. What's the first thing you do? Good. What do you look in the grantee index for? Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. So very first, you go to the grantee index, and you look to the name Dubek. Okay. And, and, and Bruce, say this happens in the year 2013, right? Which index do you start with? Yeah, I mean it's the current year, 2013. Which these indexes are usually sorted by year. So I mean, this is the book. So this is my. This is one year. Mm -hmm. So which year do you start with? Okay. Yes, you start with the current year. Okay. And Bruce, what are you looking for? You're not just looking for the name Dubeck. You're looking for what about Dubeck? Uh, yes. Yes. Right. So you're looking for when Dubeck acquired Blackacre. Right? So what does this job entail? You go to the 2013 book. You're searching in the grantee column for the name Dubeck, Dubeck, Dubeck. Not in 2013. Go to the 2012 book. Dubeck, Dubeck, no, you don't find it. 2011, 2010, and you go back year after year after year after year. And then, and? So according to this question, when do you finally find Dubeck's name? 
It's, it's in the book. Like next sentence. Right. So you find Dubeck's name in the Grantee Index in 77. Okay? And what, what's recorded in 1977? What happened that year? Hmm? Right. So you find that Dubeck was a grantee, the buyer, and then Cotter, in case you haven't known these are alphabetical, Cotter is the grantor. He's a seller. Okay? So, um, and then, then what do you do with that information? Good. Right, so you're saying you find Cotter's name in the grantee index. And then, uh, let's see, Eduardo, uh, Cotter's name, when does Cotter's name first pop up? 1952, okay. Okay. So what this means is you have a chain, right? So Dudek has in the year 2013, right? Dudek bought it from Cotter in 1977, okay? Cotter bought it from Barker in 1952, okay? And then, Eduardo, when, when did Barker get it? Uh, dot, dot, dot. We'll just skip some years. Uh, Barker, uh, 19... uh, oh, actually, you're skipping ahead. Uh, so just read the next sentence, because we, we, we'll get back to that point in a minute. So after Barker, where, where do we run back to? When, when's the original, when does the search end? Just the, the last sentence, of, uh, the first sentence of the next paragraph. Good. And so who is the original uh, grantor? Oh, right. O. Oliver is the original grantor in the year 1900. I guess they're running back 100 years. You can run back as long as you want. It varies by, by the jurisdiction. Um, if you're employing a title search company, they'll usually go back further than 100 years, and they'll, they'll do a much more thorough check. So you keep going back. Okay, so now we see that Oliver is the original grantor, at least as far back as we want to do. Okay? Jared, with that information that you know that Oliver was the original grantor, what's your next step? Excellent. Yes. And what name are we looking for? Good. Everyone get that? When we're going back in time, here, I'll put this above. When we're going back in time, we use the grantee index. When we're going forward in time, we use the grantor index. Why? Because when we're going back in time, we know who has it currently. We're trying to figure out about it before. But when we're going forward in time, we know who had it in the past. We're trying to see who had it in the future. Because these might not always match up. You can imagine a situation where perhaps the grantor records and the grantee doesn't. Or you might imagine a situation where the grantor might sell to three different people and only some of them record. So it's important to go all the way back in time and then back to the present, the grantor index. So, 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 Jared, we start, we start the grantor index search for Oliver, right? And we see that Oliver owned it in 1900. Where's the next name that Oliver's? Where's the next time that Oliver's name pops up? What happens in 1915? Right. So Oliver was a grantor, sold to Anderson. Who's the grantee? Everyone see that? So in 1915, Oliver sold it to Anderson. Okay? All right, Jeffrey, what, what happens next? Next. Uh, now, it gets, now it gets a little tricky. So Anderson sells it to Barker in 1934, but it's all recorded in 1930. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this. Okay? We know, from because the book tells us very generously, that in 1934, Anderson sells to Barker. But Jeffrey, when, did, when is that recorded? 
So Jeffrey, let me ask you this question. If you were doing a title search in 1935, right, and you were looking at Blackacre, who would be the owner of Blackacre in 1935? Uh, Anderson. Yes. Everyone see that? If Jeffrey was going through the town hall in 1935, he wouldn't see this deed because it was never recorded. He would think that, for all intents and purposes, Anderson still owned it. Right? So imagine if you're doing the title search now in the year 2013. You look at 1934, you'd see nothing. You look at 1935, you'd see nothing. 36, 37, 38, you'd see nothing. Then, like, 1939, oh, wow, look at that. There was a deed dated 1934 that was just reported. There's no limit on when you can record stuff. You can do it, I mean, maybe there's some crazy limit, but there's really no, there's no statute of limitations on this. So in 1939, you realize that Barker's now owned it for five years. But you have to check each year, because you might not know what's missing. So it's just in this case with someone who's lazy about delaying it. Okay, everyone see that? Everyone get that? It's a simple concept. Even though the deed was written in 1934, if it was never recorded, if it was never written in that book, no one knows about it. And it's not until it's written in the book that you can look back and say, oh, wow, this happened five years earlier. Okay? Okay, so Catherine, we, we see now that Anderson sold it to, to Barker in 1934. What's next? What do we do next? Okay. And what year? Right. And that matches what we saw before. And then and then finish. Exactly. And then and then what's the next transaction? Hmm? In what year? Okay. You can go look back at this chain ladder. But I'd encourage you, if you're having any difficulty, to kind of redo this exercise in your head. Um, it's very methodical. It's not difficult. This is nothing tough. It's just a matter of going through year by year and thinking about who owns what. Okay. So, um, Benjamin, let me ask you: Who was the record owner of Blackacre in 1935? Yeah, <laughs> Anderson, right? Who was actually living there, though, in 1935? Barker, right. What would have happened if Barker tried to sell Blackacre in 1935 before he recorded? Yes. Right. So that, that's where this gets messy. In this period from 1934 to 1939, Barker was presumably living there. If he tried selling it, right, and then someone did a title search say, you don't own this. Or, even worse, had he sold it and say Anderson also sold it, the Anderson guy would probably win. This is why it's important to record. But again, every case I'm going to teach you will involve some idiot not recording. This is just helps articulate why this is a uh, important system. Anyone? Questions? Yes, sir. If Anderson had also conveyed it. So, so, so Matt? But it'll be too late at that point. So uh, let, 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 let's write this one out. So let's say in the year 1935, Barker sells it to X. Right? And then 1936, Anderson sells to Y, and then Y records. What do you think happens here? Why, why wins here? The reason why, if it's not recorded, no one knows about it. This is this is actually one of the more uh, uh, weirder points to conceive. If it's not in this book, 
it doesn't exist. You might have a deed in your drawer or in a bank vault somewhere, but if it's not in this book, there's no way of knowing about it. So imagine right now that your why, right? Your why. In 1936, this guy Anderson says, hey, I want to sell you Blackacre. You do your title search. You go down to the records office. You say, wow, he's a record owner. I'm going to buy it from him. There's no reason why you would think in 1936 that, that Anderson doesn't own it. No, Anderson's a crook, and you can go sue him for other things. Barker can sue Anderson for fraud and other, other things. I'm talking about who owns it. Yes, sir. Yes, if he was there for 10 years. Not enough in this case. Yes, absolutely. The deed, an unrecorded deed, can be color of title. That's often how it happens. I was, I was make the point later. Very good. Everyone see this though. Record your deeds. Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, uh, uh, John, you want to um, just read this, this? This I like this segment from page six fifty one of the book. Um, it kind of illustrates the craziness of how far back title searches go. I don't know if anyone else enjoyed reading this as well. I thought it was pretty funny. It's uh, th th this letter beginning, gentlemen. Give your book. Yes, would you mind reading it? Just that paragraph. Just paragraph. No, it's just it's, yeah, gentlemen. Yeah. Everyone like that? Yeah, I mean, this illustrates uh, how far back title searches go. Um, of course, there is, I, I mentioned this in the other class, but there's one main group who's kind of missing in this history. Who, who's missing here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before my, my, my favorite Genoese sailor, uh, Chris Columbus, got here, there were people here. Louisiana. What happened? Well, did you study the Johnson versus McIntosh case last term? In property? That was like one of the first cases you did? The court said that they're not able to contract land. So this is actually kind of a, a somewhat disturbing, sad, true uh, history. Okay? Everyone okay with this so far? Yeah? Let's do the uh, the first case. The uh, uh, the, Lu the, the Luthi case. In Kansas. Okay? By the way, um, everyone know the old nursery rhyme, Old Mother Hubbard? Uh, so these are actually not too common anymore, but at one point they were common. It's called Old Mother Hubbard Clause. And it comes from the nursery rhyme called you know, Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard, which basically means everything's included. Um, and I think this is obscure, but I actually had a student last year who came to me and said she was working at a law firm. She said she was the only person in her entire who knew what this was. Like it came up in some obscure contract, so th this might be some chestnut you bury away for some future usage. But this case involves the standard dispute where the same lady sells the same piece of land to two different parties. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Nick. So we're talking about the Grace Owens and the Kufel uh, oil reserves. So who did you sell? Who did you sell the Kufel reserves to initially? Right. And in what manner did you sell it to the tour? Was it was it listed in the deed? How how did you sell this interest to the to the to the tour? Right. So this old lady signed this deed, which gave all of her possible oil and gas interests within the county. This is a Mother Hubbard clause. Everything in the county. Uh, Nick, at the time, do you think Grace knew that there was any oil in the Kufel reserves? 
the grace, the, the old lady. Yeah, I know Right. So, so she had some suspicion there might be oil, but she didn't list everything. Right. She could have done a different deed where she said, "I own these ten lots of land, and I agreed to give all the subsurface rights to all these ten plots of land." But they instead had this really broad contract, which says all interests within the county. Yeah. All right, and then so uh, Joel, Miss Miss Grace Owens, sold it again to someone else. Who did she sell it to the second time? Okay. And for Burris, did she specifically list which reserve she was talking about? Right, but 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 she specified which 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 land it was, right? Okay. So, uh, let's see, uh, Roberto, uh, Robert, oh, sorry, what late night? So let me ask you a question: How would, if you were a title search lawyer, right, and your client just signed this old Mother Hubbard clause, right, and you went to this book, and you wanted to list in the book the transaction? How would you record that transaction with the Old Mother Hubbard Clause, which is all the county, all the property in the county? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difficulty in doing that, though? But not just time-consuming. We actually know what the parties were had in mind. In other words. It might not be abundantly clear what Grace owns. The reason why they have these broad contracts is because it's often dispute which lands are actually owned. So if you were recording this, it would be really tough because you have to list every single possible interest, and there's likely some mistakes to be made. Okay. So in any event, uh, Wilson, were the Kufel reserves ever mentioned by name in this grant or grant index? No. Even though the Tours bought everything that she owned, in this book, was there anything linking Miss Grace to the Kufel? Okay. So now change roles and pretend that you rep represent Mr. Burris. And you're doing a title search. Is there anything in this book which would make you think that Grace doesn't own the Kufel reserves? That's right. If you were to do a search in the grant index, you would see that Grace Owens is the most recent owner of the Kufu Reserves, and there will be nothing else to change your mind about that. You want to see that? The only way you would know if Grace sold it to someone else is if someone someone's name came after her. That is, Grace was the grantor and Taurus was the grantee. That entry doesn't exist anywhere. Okay. So straight up, there's nothing telling Burris that Grace doesn't own it. Okay. Question. What would they find in the Grand Tour Index? No, oh, I'll ask you then. Okay, say say you're a title search lawyer. You go to the Grand Tour Index. What do you see? What do you see Grace giving? Well, unclear. Well, okay, good. So, say you go down to the records office and you find a copy of the deed. What do you see then? Well, what 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 clause was in the deed? What's the, what's this clause we keep talking about? Right. And if you see the old Mother Hubbard clause, would you think it's okay to buy from Grace? Okay. So in this in this case. If you just look at the grantor grant index, there's nothing telling you that Grace sold it. But say if there's some notation in the grantor grant index about the old mother upper clause, should that put you on notice that something's up? So we talk about something called constructive notice. Um, uh, Amanda, tell me what's what's constructive notice? Mm 
No, constructive recording is actual notice. What, 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 what does the word constructive mean generally in, in course? We use this word over and over again. I think I did this morning also, so we deja vu. Well, where else, in what other class have you seen the word constructive? Contracts? Where, where was it in contracts? What? Right. Does anyone remember constructive service of process from civil procedure? That's what you're getting at. So constructive means not actual, right? We don't actually know that the letter was received, but we presume if it was put in the mailbox, it was delivered. So in this case, it's clear that the grant, this old Mother Hubbard clause for the coupon reserve, was not actually listed. But the issue is, is there enough evidence in the record to put a reasonable title searcher on notice that they should be able to look for something, they should be able to find it? Okay? Everyone get that? So Amanda, was there, in this case, was there enough for constructive notice? What did the court say? Why? Why is a Mother Hubbard clause not constructive notice? Right. Right. So, um, Stephanie, imagine how much work would it be if you're doing a title search and you came across one of these old Mother Hubbard clauses and you tried to determine every piece of land this uh, Miss Grace owns? How, how would that be a lot of work? Why does a court not want to make that that a requirement? Right. This places a huge burden on the title searchers because now instead of searching that book for one name and one piece of property, they might have to search for an infinite number of properties. Did you ever deal with this? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, you would catch it and you would see that you call someone and you would run those letters forward. But how, how would you know? Right, but, but how would you know who sold Kupal? We're, we're in a grant or grant index, we don't have track. How would you know where, where did the Kupal come from? Well, you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't be mentioning it. So you'd have to look to the entire grand key index to see wherever grades of game occurred. Well, I think, I mean, uh, it's, it's unlikely. I was talking to a colleague there. Oh, yeah, what did he say? He, he said that, you know, this, it, he agreed that. So he thought it would be too much work for the title searcher to have to find everything. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, I mean, it could be done. I mean, if you wanted to, you could ascertain every piece of property that Grace ever obtained, right? You go to the grantee index, and whenever you see Grace's name, you say, okay, she bought this piece of land. You say, okay, you know, 30 years ago, someone sold a Kufel. Let me see if maybe someone else bought Kufel. But it's a lot of work. And the purpose of opinions like this is to make buying property easy. We don't want to make it really tough. We don't want to make you know our, our, our friend have to do all this like research and, and, and uh, investigation to this history. So it's enough work to look through one person's relation to a land. We don't want to make them have to look through the entire history of everything they've ever owned. Okay? So in this case, the Mother Hubbard Clause was not good enough for constructive notice. It will be too costly and too time consuming and too burdensome to impose this requirement. Everyone okay with that? The entire issue with constructive notice is, is there enough evidence in the record, in those books, to put me on notice that I should be looking somewhere else? We're going to do, we're going to do a few examples in a moment where even though something's not written clearly, you should know something's up. Okay. Uh, one, one note um, that, that's in the book that's important. What happens if the person who's recording it, the, the clerk of court, makes a typo? Uh, PJ? 
the person recording it spells something wrong. As a result, you don't catch an error. Can you go sue the government? Why do you say that? Well, it's in the reading. Uh, anyone? Well, why, why can't you sue the government? This is a broader point, which you all know. Immunity, right? The, the king, it comes from this doctrine, the king can do no wrong. So generally, government agents have immunity. You can't sue them unless they really mess up and violate your constitutional rights. Uh, it's actually really tough. I hope no one read that section on government, is government survey because I don't know why it's in the book. Uh, okay. Anyone read it? Sorry. I made it clear. I was like, skip it. But every, every year someone reads it. Okay, any other questions before we go into the next case, the or case? All right. All right, so let's do the, the, uh, the, the or case. So there's this doctrine... Idam sonans, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, which which translates loosely to sounding the same. So does anyone ever go to Google and you type something and Google like, oh, did you mean this? Yeah, I do it all the time. I can't spell. In fact, whenever there's a word I have no idea to spell, I throw it to Google and hope they can figure it out because it's usually better than Word. Uh, it, it's actually much better. So this is basically that doctrine. You can imagine that before computers, People are manually transcribing stuff into those big, musty books. People would make typos. They might misspell a name, or they might tr uh, transpose a letter. So in your experiences with title searches, how did you handle, you know, common misspellings of names? I guess before you go back to the more common words, then you just have to run that out and see it. Okay, so let's, let's take this. I mean, Elliot, it's a fairly, you know, common name, right? So, Elliot, two L's, two T's. Elliot, two L's, one T. Elliot, one L, one T. So, if you were searching for the name Elliot, would you search every variant? Mm -hmm. How many different variants would you be search for a name? Um, the real problem is if you have someone different. Oh, like, like, like W, like a first initial? William K or... William, William K. Something. Right. So it's easy to make these mistakes. I mean, even now, um, you know, people misspell names all the time. Um, this doctrine, item sonans, exists to make sure that simply because a name isn't spelled right, that people won't give up. That effectively imposes kind of an obligation on a title searcher to check alternate spellings. How far this goes is the subject of this case. So actually, the facts of this case are kind of, are kind of interesting. Uh, so we have this guy named Orr, and he gets a judgment, 50 grand against this guy named Elliot. The lawyer for Orr messes up, right? So everyone knows how this works. You know, if, if, if I sue Josh, right, and I win, I win a 50,000 judgment against him. If he can't pay up, <laughs> excuse me, if he, thank you, if he can't pay up, I have to collect it from him. Say he doesn't have any money. What I can actually do is record a judgment against him. You might call it a lien. You can call it whatever you want. But if he ever tries to sell a piece of property or do something, there will be a record on his name in that index saying that Josh owes me 50 grand. So any transaction which he does will be, will be you know, marred. Okay. So in this case, the lawyer, though, messes up. When he tries to record the judgment... There should be two L's and two T's. He uh, spells it, uh, I'm sorry, with two L's and one T. Okay? So if you're a lawyer, what's the most important thing about being a lawyer, ultimately? No, even more important. <laughs> Getting paid. The most important thing, I'm being so facetious, but ultimately, <laughs> you have to get paid. And imagine if you're this lawyer, you litigated the case, you won, and then because you forgot to write the name correctly, you don't get paid. Because this lawyer won't get paid until the judgment comes through. It's probably some sort of contingency arrangement. So because the lawyer messed up the judgment, okay, or, I'm sorry, Elliot sells it to someone else. 
when someone else, whose name is actually Fire, I can't believe that's actually the buyer's name, but when the buyer does the title search, will he see Elliot's name anywhere in the record book, uh, Sam? Right. Well, but he's searching for two L's and two T's, right? Will he see any judgment against Elliot with two L's and two T's? Had he done a search for the alternate spellings, would he have found it? He probably, yeah, he probably would have. Okay? So then, so then this other guy buys it. The buyer buys it. He gets a mortgage. Elliot, I'm sorry, or finds out, and he sues. Sam, why is he going after this new guy? No, no, why, why is he suing this guy for money? I'm doing the thing. Come on. What does this mean? He has money, right? He just bought a house. He just got a mortgage. He got cash. So he's trying to recover this from the next owner. He's trying to get money from the next owner. Okay? So he actually sues him. And, and it gets even a little bit more interesting. And this was kind of addressed in a footnote. But it seems that there was a malpractice action, right? Yeah. If you're Mr. Orr and your lawyer screws up, you sue for legal malpractice. If you're all lawyers and you have a client and your client's instruction to you is record this judgment so I can get paid and you mess up, you can bet your ass you're going to be sued. Big time. But actually what happened here, and it seems that the lawyer settled out, he paid Mr. Orr, so Orr is out of the picture. And the only thing the lawyer is fighting for is whatever judgment he can recover in this case. So the lawyer is effectively arguing this case on behalf of himself. There's no more client. It's just a lawyer. Okay. Everyone see that? Not not too important, but spell stuff right or else you're gonna get sued. Okay. So uh, 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 Jason, what does the court say then about this Idam Sonans doctrine? It actually says it is important. Why not? Um, why, why should the doctrine not be applied here? Think, think, think of poor Luke here, right? What does it do to poor Luke by applying this doctrine of idem sonans? Right. So this is similar to the last case. By applying this doctrine, you impose a duty on the title searchers. What is that duty? To search through many possible spellings of these names. Right? It's a lot of work. You know, ima imagine a very common name like, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, give me a common name that's spelled a lot of different ways. John, J-O-N, J-O-H-N, you know, Jonathan, uh, uh, you know, there are various names, diminutives also, people with middle initials. So what the court says is we're going to stick to not applying this doctrine. So it's sufficient to just search for, for two L's and two T's and that's enough. That this doctrine does not apply. Does that make sense? If you're sensing a trend, it's to make title searching easier. This trend isn't so much of protecting sloppy lawyers, right? Because the idea is, if you recorded your thing correctly, you wouldn't have this problem. If he had spelled his client's name right, which is the one name you should know, how to spell your client's name so you can bill him, right? This wouldn't be an issue. So, I mean, this lawyer here is not totally, you know, he's not totally without fault. In fact, the fault is his. Uh, there's a certain irony of the fact that he misspelled the name wrong. Now he's blaming someone else for misspelling it wrong. You should get your names right. Okay. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Luke, 
What, what do you think? I mean, how is, in your, in your experience, how are how is technology and computers, at least your recent records, uh, changed the name of the game? Right. I mean, effectively, the trends continue. Even though a lot of counties have gone digital, many haven't. Uh, and if you have time, go down to the Harris County Records Office and just check it out and try and do a title search. Just like look at your parents' house or something and see how far back it goes. Uh, it, it, it's it's tough. Um, so even though you can do text searches, you still have to be precise, and courts probably have not relaxed this doctor much. Questions? Yes, sir. So at the common law, the term is the courts trying to be very cautious with the Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, well, what do you mean by exhaustive? No, and I think the court actually kind of implies that item sonance hasn't really been applied in this in this context. I think what the common law does is it says if there's something which you should be able to find, constructive notice, you're charged with finding it. But we're not going to ask you to search for things that are spelled differently. Right? So constructive notice, though, is a big deal. Because if you can piece together what happened, then you're on notice that you should find it. Yes, ma'am. So explain explain to explain to the class what the sound deck system is, please. Um, it just pulls up anything that's phonetic. So so if you put in a name like you know like like Blackman or whatever, and it will put all different variations and spellings, and you need this when you're doing search war warrants and stuff, trying to figure yeah, aliases. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Let's move on to recording statutes, which is kind of the, the the meatier part of this lesson. Okay. So there's often a lot of unfairness, right? The example I gave before. I sell, you know, land to Nick. I sell the same land to Capricia. If 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 Capricia records first, there's some unfairness. So what a lot of jurisdictions have done is they've enacted something called recording statutes. And the purpose of the recording statutes is to specify in advance who gets the land if there's a dispute. Okay? And it always involves, at least for today, the same case. I sell to Nick. I also sell to Capricia. Thereafter, the facts vary. So the easiest recording statute, which is actually, I think, in only two states, Louisiana and North Carolina. Uh, so many of Louisiana friends here, you might deal with this. It's called the race statute. Uh, Facundo, can you please tell me what is a race statute? Good. And I'm going to spell this out in somewhat lengthy language, but it's important to phrase like this. As between successive purchasers, right? So that would be Nick and Capricia. The person who wins race to record prevails. So I sell Black Acre to Nick. I sell Black Acre to Capricia. She records first. She wins the race. She prevails. This is the easiest one to, to, uh, to consider. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I know what you're talking about. We can talk about that after class. It's something uh, uh, not directly on point. But the, the reason why this is called race is because it's a race. They're racing to the records office. They want to get there first and put their name in the book. Uh, Matthew, does it matter under a race statute whether Capricia knew about my earlier sale to Nick? Doesn't matter. So even if she knew that I sold it to him first, right? I sell to Nick, pay for a thousand dollars, 
And then I tried to sell Capriccio for $1,000. She says, no, I'm not going to buy it for that much. You sold it to Nick yesterday. I was like, okay, fine. I'll sell it to you for $500. It's a deal. She goes and records first. Even though she knew she was in on this, under a race statute, it doesn't matter. These are not very fair because she might know about it. She might know that she's screwing Nick out of the land, but it doesn't matter. But this does have the advantage of certainty and a bright line rule. Why? She recorded first. Her name is in the book first. There's no dispute. Yes, Nick? <laughs> you can sue my ass, yeah. <laughs> Don't ever forget that. He can... Uh, you could sue me, and then I could probably sue her through identification. But, but yes, I committed fraud. Don't ever forget this. All the property owners in this case are fraud. But I'm not. We're not in torts now. We're we're, we're not con, we're not considering fraud action. All we're considering is who owns the property. So again, these are only Louisiana and North Carolina. It just doesn't come up a lot. Okay. The more common one, I think the probably the most I think it's the most popular one in the United States. It's called the notice statute, and this is what we have here in, uh, in, in uh, Texas. And in case anyone's watching, Ted Cruz is still talking uh, four hours late. I, I see Ben here also. Uh, okay. I'm getting in trouble. So we have a notice statute. Okay? What's that? Speaking of Texas. The notice statute. Okay. Um, is that Hayden? No. Tell me what a notice statute is, please. If they had or didn't have, be precise. You're really close. Things it's the opposite. Let, let, let me let me type out like this, right? So if a subsequent purchaser had notice of prior unrecorded instrument, the purchaser could not prevail over prior grantee. So let's use my, my favorite two con artists in this class again, okay? So I sell to Nick. He doesn't record. He's lazy, whatever. Then I say, hey, Capricia, I sold this to Nick yesterday. You want it? She's like, yeah, sure. I'll go record it today. I sell it to Capricia, and she knows about it. Hayden, under this case, who prevails between those two? I'm sorry? No. Did she? Uh, did Capricia have notice? I told her. I told her before I was like, hey, I sold this to Nick yesterday. Did Capricia have notice? If a person has notice, can they take advantage of the statute? Right. So who wins in that case? No. If you have notice, you can't rely on the statute. If you have notice, who gets it? Read it. Right, so did the subsequent purchaser have notice? So can, can she prevail over the prior grantee? No. Nick wins. Under a notice statute, if the subsequent buyer has notice, she cannot prevail. Nick wins. Let me give you the opposite example. I sell to Nick. I sell to Capricia. I keep my mouth shut. Don't say a word. She has no notice about the sale to Nick because he never reported. Uh, uh, Jared, who wins in that case? I sell to Nick. I sell it to Capricia, I keep my mouth shut. And then, who owns in that case? Uh, no one recorded anything. I sell to Nick, I sell to Capricia, neither records and neither knows about any transaction. No, but between the two of them, who wins? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in jail. <laughs> no. Read it. Capricia is a subsequent purchase. Did she have notice? 
So if you prevail, which one is it? Are you sure? Final answer? Yes, she prevails. If the subsequent purchaser did not have notice, right from the words of the phrase, then she prevails of the prior grantee name. Uh, I had no notice, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, did I? Uh, I hope I didn't confuse you. I'm sorry. When I try to type the notes in real time, I occasionally make a mistake, so if you see that, please tell me. I, I apologize. Okay. So if the purchaser had notice, and if I confuse you, I apologize. So the purchaser had notice, so if Capricia had notice, she can't win. If she had no notice, she didn't know about it, she was you know, ignorant, whatever, didn't know anything, then she wins. The reason why we have the statute is we don't want to reward collusion. You can imagine a situation where I'm dealing on the side with her. It's like, listen, I sold this to him yesterday. I'm going to sell it to you today for half the price. You go record and you get to keep it first. We don't want to reward that. We want to punish that. We only want to reward the innocent subsequent purchaser. That is, I sell it to Nick, then I sell it to Capricia. Capricia doesn't know. Capricia did her title search. Uh, Colin, uh, a safer example that I sold it to Nick you know, in 2012. And in 2013, I sold to Capricia. Nick never recorded. Is there any way for Capricia to know about the conveyance to Nick? Why? That's right. Because he didn't record, there's no way for Capricia to know. So she's what we call innocent subsequent purchaser. She's innocent, um, unlike Pretty Spears. Not that. Anyway, yes. That's notice. Yeah, if she has notice, is notice. If she knew of the earlier conveyance to Nick, then she has notice, and then she can't rely on the statute. Well, it could be constructive also. Either actual or constructive. Something that should put her on notice that someone else might own the land, or that might be conveyed to someone else. This, in this part, to answer your question before, there is an exhaustive duty, right? So say, I think, I think this case might come up later, but say you heard that maybe Josh sold it to Nick, but you weren't really sure. You probably have some sort of notice at that point to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like say if you go and look at the place. Yeah, that, that, that's a good sign. Yeah, if someone else is living there. That might, that might be a notice. That might be a, a signal that something's up. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, Luke, when you were doing your tile searches, did you use tax records also? Yeah. All right. Yes, sir? Uh, no. They don't have to. Yes. Yes. So let me repeat what he just said. I was intentionally not getting there. I was going to get there in a minute, but that's a good point. Under the notice statute, there's no requirement that Capricia actually records. None. So Nick doesn't record. Capricia doesn't record. Between the two of them, Capricia still wins. That leads me to the third one, where recording does matter. So, uh, Lucas, if you can, try to walk me through the race notice. This, this is... Now, this is pretty rare. I, I think it's in some of the western states. I think mean, California has it, among others. But walk me through the, the race notice. Okay. Yeah. Good. 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 So it's like combining it. So I said one minute ago, under a notice statute, Capricia doesn't have to record. Okay? But under a race notice statute, she would. So I sell to Nick, I sell to Capricia. Capricia has no knowledge of my earlier sale. Then she records. Under a race notice statute, she wins. 
But what if she doesn't record, Lucas? If she doesn't record, will she win? Well, it's actually trickier. So let, 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 let me write this out because actually, uh, it's actually example four in the book. I, I don't have the page number. If anyone can call it out. Thank you. Uh, let's let's jump back there to the, to the corner, please. Kim, can you mind reading example four? I'm um, 668. Can you read out loud, please? That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't get the answer yet. Okay, that's okay. Let, let, let's walk through this, okay, one step at a time. Really easy to read the answer. Okay. So we're in a race notice statute here. So again, I convey to Nick. Nick doesn't report. Then I, I convey it to Capricio. Okay, she has no notice. <coughs> Nick records... Then Capricia records. Okay. So, uh, Kim, in a notice jurisdiction, let's change the question a little bit. If we were in a notice jurisdiction, who would win? This is the example I gave before. I sold it to Nick. He doesn't record. I sold it to Capricia. She doesn't record. Who would win under notice jurisdiction? No, no, in a notice jurisdiction. <laughs> That's okay. Pretend, pretend for a second this didn't happen. This, this bull part, this didn't happen. Okay? I'll put it up here. If you're in a notice jurisdiction, who wins? Just with, just with these two facts. Right. Capricia wins. Why? Because she took without notice. The race notice statute, though, adds additional layer. It's not enough to take without notice. You have to take without notice and record first. Let me say that again. In a race notice jurisdiction, Capricia not only needs to take without notice, but she needs to record first. Um, uh, Azar, who records first in this case? Capricia or Nick? Nick. So Capricia doesn't record first, right? So does she lose out? Yes. Let, let, me, let me type this out. So the race notice, a subsequent purchaser is protected against prior unrecorded instruments only if two things happen. One, the subsequent purchaser has no notice. And two, the subsequent purchaser reports first. I'll walk you through this. I convey to Nick. I convey to Capricio. She has no notice. In a notice jurisdiction, that's enough for her to win. But the race notice adds one more requirement. Not only does she have to be unaware of the previous conveyance, she needs to record first. She needs to record first. In this case, Nick records first. He wins, even though he was a subsequent, even though he was a previous buyer. Okay, let's actually go back and let's do example three. So I think this I like to out of order. So, um, uh, uh, Florian, can you please read uh, uh, example three? I guess it's on the previous page. Oh, okay. I'll, here it is. Can you see this? Is that big enough for you? Okay. So please read example three.
Okay. Okay, stop there. Okay. So this is the case we did before. I own Blackacre. I convey it to Nick. Nick doesn't record. I then convey it to Capricio, right? Capricio has no knowledge. So under notice, who wins? Okay. Now under this question, make a race notice jurisdiction. Who wins? Yes. Under a notice statute, it doesn't matter who records. Under race notice, it makes a very big difference who records. That's okay. In the race notice <laughs> jurisdiction, does the person have to remain unnotified at the time of the reporting or only at the time of the day? And she just say, oh, shit. Sure. You got another title. I better go get. I think it's at the time of conveyance. Um, I don't think there's any kind of ongoing duty on behalf of the buyer to do this. Now, if remember we did warranties a few weeks ago, remember that? If you go, oh shit, he sold it to Nick, then you can go sue me under one of the warranties of, uh, of you know, quiet enjoyment or something. So that's where it would actually come into play. But you don't have an obligation there. You, you, you would still be the record owner. Yeah. Because what would happen is Nick would come back from the picture and try and sue to, to eject you, and then you would have to sue me for the quiet enjoyment uh, one. Okay. I know it's a little funky. Questions? Let's talk through this because it, it, I promise you there will be a question like this in the exam. And, and let me say something <laughs> very clearly. I will tell you what jurisdiction it is. I will say it's either race, race notice, or, 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 or whatever. I will tell you what jurisdiction it is. Don't try to infer from the facts what it is. I had one student last semester and it killed me. Um, I wrote somewhere in the fact that all common law rules apply and this is a notice jurisdiction. And she thought, oh well, at common law there's only race, so it has to be a race jurisdiction. She got like a lot of points off. Don't do that. I will tell you very clearly what the jurisdiction is and do what I say and you will, do, you will be fine. Comprende? Good. Okay, this is actually, uh, just, just so you're exposed to it, this is actually with the Texas uh, uh, notice jurisdiction, like a link to the section of the code. Uh, uh, where is it? Yeah, th th this last provision, which is framed somewhat awkwardly, uh, but it speaks of having actual notice. So the only way you can, the only way a subsequent buyer wins in Texas is if he doesn't have notice. If the subsequent buyer has notice, he can't take advantage of the statute. Okay. Questions about this? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, though, because the only way you have notice is something that's recorded, right? I mean, the predominant way why a person would have notice is if something's recorded. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Really, I, I, I think the goal of what the courts are trying to do is to protect innocent subsequent buyers. Right? We want to protect Capricia. She bought this land. She had no idea of my, my, my faulty dealings with Nick. We want to protect her. That's what the courts want to do. They want to make things settled. And more likely than not, if she's the last person to buy it, she's probably living on the land. He's not. If he was living there, she would have seen something and had notice. So we want to maintain the status quo. If she's living on the land, we keep her there. Okay? All right, any questions? All right. Um, the, the last case 
Uh, I'll mention it briefly. I'm probably going to cut it next year. I flirt with it every year. Uh, but but, the, but the, the most important takeaway um, from this case actually deals with um, whether... Second, I don't know, scroll down. It has to do with bad deeds and what happens when a deed is not formally attested. Um, so just know that deeds have to be followed through with all the formalities, that uh, you can't have someone vouch for a notary. If you actually want to have a deed notarized, that's be notarized. Um, there's, I'm probably going to drop that case next year. There's not too much there, but it does have some good oil and gas stuff. But in our limited time remaining, I'd like to actually work through example one, uh, which comes right, I'm sorry, problem one. On page, I think it's six sixty nine, and we'll 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 run this one through till the end. Okay, so um, David, okay, there we go. Problem one. All right, so can you please read aloud the question, David? Yeah, it says problem in notes number one. Okay, let's stop there, okay? So let, let, let's map this case out, because it's actually a decent question. So O conveys to A, A doesn't report. This is problem one. Okay. Okay. O dies, okay? It's a very common deal where people write a will, they leave certain properties in their will to someone else, and then they forget about it. And during their lives, they sell the property that's in their will. So, so David, really simple question. If I sold something and it's disposed of my will to someone else later, at the time of my death, can, does anything happen? So say I leave in my will Blackacre to Nick. But then the next year I sell to Capricia. I die. Does Nick get Blackacre? Why do you say that? So at the time of my death, when my will is probated, do I even have Black Acre to give? No. That'd be really bad, right? After I sold my land during my lifetime, at the time of my estate, I don't have Black Acre anymore. I can't leave my heirs something I don't have. So it's often the case that land will be in a will, and the owner no longer has it. Okay, so let's go back to this question. Uh, I'll go to uh, Marco. O conveys to A. A doesn't record. O dies. Okay, but the H, who's the heir, Marco, does the heir know anything about this transaction to A at this point? Is there any reason how we could possibly know about it? Why? Is there any way for H to know about this transaction? It's not recorded. No, no. How, 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 how could H possibly know about this transaction? Is there any way? How do we know if stuff happens? What's the only way we know if stuff happens? What's the process? Was it recorded? So is there any way for H to know about this transaction? No. There's no way for the heir to know about this transaction. So as far as he's concerned, he owns it. Okay? Something all the way back there. So Ian, H is the heir. He has you know, no notice. He conveys it to B. And then B records. Ian, is there any way that B could know about this earlier transaction A? Right, it was never recorded. Yeah, B records without notice. Okay. So between A and B, 
in a notice jurisdiction, who wins? Why? Yes. Good. Now let me ask another question. Between the air and A, who would win? Yeah. Yeah, before he sold it. Who would win? <laughs> Actually, what's interesting is A would win because the air never got it. In this case, view the air as a fraudster, right? The air is selling property he doesn't own. The air is selling property he doesn't have. He's selling something he doesn't have. He didn't get it by the by the will. But he can still sell it to someone else, and that next person's protected. B is protected even though H never had it. H never had it in the first place, but H can still sell land he doesn't own and protect B. Isn't that messed up? We want to promote certainty. Yes. He goes, Air never bought it. He inherited it, but the inheritance was no good. In other words, if A went and challenged the probate, right, he would say, you never got it. So there's actually no, doesn't even need the recording statute. You never bought it. He's an heir. Yes, sir. Yeah, well... Uh, but that, but if there's a straw man, there's notice, right? Yeah. If you, it, so, so what he's asking is, can you use intermediary to try to cut someone out? The intermediary is going to know. And in a notice statute, I'm sorry, in a notice jurisdiction, that kills the reporting statute. You can't rely on it. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> right. You mean, can the H, can the air? Well, it doesn't really matter because the H doesn't have title in either case. Well, it doesn't matter if H had notice or not because he didn't buy it. This entire stuff only comes into play if there's actually a purchase being made. Does that make sense? If you're inheriting, it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. The fact that he sells that property doesn't have to be future interest. Yes. Yes. Now I'm talking about these like two different dates. Because say say the will was drafted in, in you know 1990 and the property sold in 2000, right? By the time the will's probated. That line in the will is effectively nullity. You can't convey property if you're deaf that you don't have. The will doesn't like magically return the future interest because you no longer has it. This happens people don't update their wills. And one of the reasons why probate is so expensive and time consuming is they have to ascertain if is the property in this document actually belong to the person. I know it's tricky stuff, this is a dry class. I'm sorry to give it to you on your on your day back. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, and feel free to come up and test me afterwards. All right, thank you so much. I'll see you on Thursday.